You know, it's kind of interesting, friends, that we all want to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. Isn't it interesting the NBA is back and the NHL is back and, and the MBL, Major Baseball League? I mean, they're all back. And even though there's no fans out there and it's such a surrealistic experience, but people, even over superfluous things, things that are really not even relevant, they want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. It might be a football team, a baseball team, a basketball team, a hockey team. But you know, friends, when you're part of the kingdom of God, when you're part of the ecclesia, God's church, what Jesus laid his life down for, you're part of something significant, relevant. It's got eternal fingerprints on it. It's something bigger than you, bigger than me. That's why, friends, I love to give to God's work. I love to give my time, my talent, my treasure. I love to further the kingdom of heaven. And unlike a football game or a baseball game, as enjoyable as it can be, I just spend time when I watch it. I don't invest time. I spend time. If you're investing your time in watching sports, well, friends, ultimately, it's just a failure. Your team eventually is going to lose. They're not going to win the Super Bowl every year or, you know, the World Series or whatever the case is. You see, friends, I don't spend time in the kingdom of God. I invest time. It brings back dividends, friends, and manifold dividends of 30-fold, 40-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. According to your faith, so be it. So thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving. And let's continue to not grow weary in well-doing. Well, our series is continuing part nine on Let's Be Church. Sometimes we call it letsbechurch.com. Let me illustrate the church this way. One day, a six-year-old girl was sitting in her first grade class, and the teacher was going to explain evolution to children, how there was a big bang instead of a big God, and how it all started with um, non-living matter that through this big bang became living matter, and then we were amoebas or volvoxes, a single-celled animal, and, um, and eventually uh, we became apes, and here we are people. There's a lot more to evolution than that. So the teacher, in explaining evolution, she asked a little boy, Tommy, said, do you see the tree outside? And he said, yes, teacher, I do. The teacher asked Tommy, do you see the grass outside? And Tommy said, yes, I see the tree, I see the grass. The teacher instructed Tommy, go to the window, look up and see, can you see the sky? And he said, teacher, I see the sky, affirmative. Then the teacher said, Tommy, do you see God? Tommy said, no, just the tree, the grass, and the sky. And the teacher concluded, my point is that we can't see God because he isn't there. You can't see him. A little girl that was observing the class um, said to the teacher, she wanted to know, uh, can I ask Tommy a few questions? And uh, the teacher said, sure. She agreed. Then the little girl turned to Tommy and asked the same questions very gently. Tommy, do you see the tree outside? Tommy said, yes. Okay. Uh, then, then, then she said, do you see the grass outside? Tommy was getting tired of these questions and said, yes. She continued, Tommy, do you see the sky up in the air? He said, yes. Then the little girl asked, Tommy, do you see the teacher? Tommy said, Yes. Then she said, one more question. Okay, do you see the teacher's brain? Tommy said, well, no. The little girl concluded, does that mean our teacher doesn't have one? So often we think if we can't see something empirically that it doesn't exist. We're engaged in a series, Let's Be the Church. And the scripture says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, even though it's the evidence of things not seen. And many of us think if we do not have an empirical method by which with our five senses we can actually chronicle something that maybe it doesn't exist or it didn't happen or didn't. Yeah, that's it. Our entire series is based on a question that Jesus actually proposed to his disciples. Do you remember the question? This is what we're going to be using for our foundation for quite some time. 
Now, we're called to be a balanced church. Can you say the word with me? Balanced church. Balanced church. Now, here's our big idea today. A balanced church often requires, this is going to sound strange now, seasons of imbalance. A balanced church often requires seasons of being out of balance or an imbalance, if you will, seasons. This is a Hebrew concept. In fact, the word for balance in the Hebrew, it means going from imbalance to imbalance in order to achieve balance. How can that be? We'll illustrate that later. Going from imbalance to imbalance in order to achieve a position of balance. Critical question in our series on the church. Here it is. Matthew 16, verse 13 to 18, Jesus having a conversation with the apostles. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, some say that there are, remember this, John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, but whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, well, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto you, but my Father, I like this, which is in heaven. Hmm. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, Petra, and upon this rock, Petros, I will build my ekeleo or ekelesia, depending on what form we're dealing with now. I will build my church. And here's an interesting one that we'll cover probably next week. And the gates of hell. Yeah, we're going to teach on the gates of hell. You're going to love this. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will build. Jesus is talking my church. So what does the church look like that Jesus is building? That's what we've been talking about these last two weeks. Churches that are built on extremes, there's churches that are built on a certain emphasis, is not necessarily, in a pure sense, the church that Jesus is building. So we have to ask this question, is my church built on Jesus? Is it a church that Jesus is building? We're called to be a people of influence, every single one of us. Uh, I don't have time to get into it today, but we will get into it. The very word for influence is the picture of a river. And I'm going to show you that you are called, when we're influencing somebody, they're getting into our flow, into our current, into our river. So if somebody would get into your life, if somebody would be influenced by you, where would your old man river ultimately transport them? Echeleo, if you will. Called out. Now, now, now the, 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 it, it's, it literally means to be the, the called out of. The called out of who? Well, it's the called out of Christ. You see, ultimately, ekaleo meant to be called out from a city, and you were like a senator, a congressman, a politician, believe it or not. You were called out from a city, and there were a number of cities involved, to make decisions that would influence the rest of the cities and the neighboring cities and eventually the provinces as well and an entire nation. Can you imagine we're called out. By who? Jesus. For what? The establishment of the kingdom of God on earth, even as it is in heaven. And I'm wondering, how influential are you? How influential am I? Are we building a church where people take note, as they did with the disciples, that we've been with Jesus? Do people look at us as those speaking with authority? Do people, like in Acts chapter 2, do they want to join us, conjoin themselves to us because they see that we have influence? They see signs and wonders. We don't run after them, but they run after us. Signs and wonders shall follow them that believe. See, the church is called out to be powerful, not to be mocked. When you look at the church today, do we have the dunamis? Do we have the power? 
that Jesus calls us to have? Do we have the influence that he calls us to have? Do we have the biblical recognition that he calls us to have? Do people take note that we've been with Jesus? Do people take note that we speak with authority? What kind of church are we? Are we an anemic church or a powerful church? Jesus, we're told, you are the what? Son of God. Say that with me. Jesus is the Son of God. Come on. Jesus is the Son of God. Now, what did we learn last week? He's coming back for a bride. I remember on September 13th, I arrived in British Columbia, a little city called uh, Clearbrook. It was a Wednesday, and I was getting married on a Saturday. So I actually it was the 12th, the 12th of September. And I arrived later that evening with my best man, Martin R. Sheldon, to come and claim my bride, Marjorie G. Dirksen. This is back in 1979. And friends, I was coming back from Ontario, Oregon, where I was pastoring for my bride. And I was going to be bringing her back as well. Jesus is coming back for a bride. I was excited, and I ended up with a bride without spot, without blemish, without wrinkle. And let me tell you, that nine-and-a-half-hour trip from Ontario, Oregon, all the way to British Columbia was well worth the drive. We have lost sight of the romantic and beautiful till death do us part Judaic thought and concept of what it means. The one that Jesus spoke of to come back for a bride. The Bible says that literally, and let me kind of give you a picture of this. Back in the early church and actually in Judaism prior to the church, let's walk in the feet just for a moment of Rabbi Jesus. Let's walk in the dust, rather, of Rabbi Jesus. And I want you to recognize that when a groom was going to marry a bride, he would literally leave the bride for a while and he would go to prepare a place for her, to prepare a place for family. And um, he would actually give her all these gifts. It's kind of interesting. Jesus led captivity captive. He gave gifts unto men. And you'd find that the groom would have all these gifts. There was makeup, and there was beautiful fragrances of cologne, and there was these bath salts, and there's all this jewelry. Come on, guys. We need to step up our game. And you would go back and prepare this home for her. And what the Bible says, no man knows the time, only the Father's in heaven. And it talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Well, you know what? Nobody knew when the groom was coming. Never knew if he was coming in the middle of the night. That's what this is all about in Scripture. And this is the church. This is what the church is all about, friends. This is our relationship. We are the bride of Christ. He is the groom. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not tell you. He says, I am going to go, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. This is all about the church. Oh, we'll cover this in a major way, if you will. But I'm wondering, have we lost sight of the bride? Have we lost sight of the bride? That Hebrew thought talks about that, 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 that Judaism talks about. I'm talking about the Song of Solomon, bride. Have you ever read the Song of Solomon? March said when we first got married that she appreciated me having devotions with her. But honey, 20 years in a row, every night, why do our devotions have to come from the Song of Solomon? Come on now. Well, we did read some other things as well. And For those of you offended, you need to get more romantic. We need to get a picture, guys that our wife symbolizes the church. Did you know that? Raise your hand if you knew that. The bride of Christ, she is the church. Hey, dude, you symbolize Christ. And that's why we're to bathe our wife. We're to wash her with the washing of the water of the word. This is why, friends, gifts are important. I listen to couples that say, oh, for our anniversary and for her birthday and my birthday, we don't exchange gifts. Can I tell you something? We are, we're not modeling for our kids what Jesus Christ calls us to do. Guys, we are to value our wife. See, when you find a good wife, you obtain favor from the Lord. Do you know I have found a good thing 
in Finding Marge, and she's not an inanimate object, but you get the point. In fact, the scripture is so spot on. It's so crystal clear that I am to do everything necessary, everything within my power, everything under the auspices of the Holy Spirit to be able to ultimately present my wife Marge as a bride without spot, without blemish, without wrinkle. So these gifts we adorn her with, you can say, oh, I don't believe in jewelry. I don't believe in the makeup and all this stuff. I'm not going to get into all the debate here, all the debates on this subject. But friends, when people look at the way we treat our wives and ladies, the way you reverence, respect your husband, this is what brings people to Christ. Did you know your marriage is a living testimony, a living example of what Jesus did for the church, with how, the, how the church interfaces, interacts, and also relates to Jesus as well. You know, isn't it amazing? If you think I'm a little bit off today or a little bit weird, don't you want a pastor who after 41 years, this September 15th at 2 p.m., after 42 years, is still deeply in love with his wife? Friends, if I'm looking for a church today, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story. I look for a church where, yes, the pastor's in the word. He knows the word. He loves his people more than he loves himself, and that's great. But you know my number one prayer? Once you get beyond the theology, the doctrine, and you know the, the pastor actually you know, loves the people, the way a pastor treats his wife. Listen to me. Come here. Come here. You, you coming here now? Come here. The way a pastor treats his wife is ultimately an indication of how he's going to treat the church, how he's going to treat you. Did you, do you believe that? It's really the truth. So here's my question. What kind of bride do you think Jesus is the called out ones? That's what it's talking about. Ecclesia, the called out ones. It's talking about the church. The whole analogy of the bride and the groom is talking about the church, the living testimony of who Jesus is. So I'm wondering, what kind of bride do you think he's calling out to himself? Do you think he's looking for one who stinks? Do you think he's looking for one who never brushes her teeth? Do you think he's looking for one who never goss who always gossips and is selfish and could care less about him or the ones he died for? I think sometimes, friends, and this is going to sound offensive, Spoiler alert, kids in the room, they need to know this. I'm going to say something intense right now, friends. Are you ready? Here it is. Jesus, and this is a biblical concept, so don't be mad at me. Jesus teaches this. When he says he's coming back for a bride without spot, blemish, or wrinkle, read this in the Greek language, and this was the Jewish concept. Here's how it actually reads. He's coming back for a bride without spot, blemish, or wrinkle, not a whore. <gasps> How can you say that in church, Jesus did? That was the whole picture. And guys, I'm not just talking about women. We're the bride of Christ. When I am a friend with the world, that's called whoredom. That means literally, when I'm friendship with the world says I'm an enemy of God's. When I so love the world, the Lord refers to me, look at the book of Hosea, as a whore. Do you know in the, the, the word that's used in the Hebrew in Hosea is worse than the English word slut? <gasps> I'm cheating on my God. Pastor, you shouldn't preach this. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't preach the word. It's pretty intense, isn't it? But friends, Jesus was intense. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you got no life in you. I mean, come on. A whole bunch of people left him that day. Hmm. So let's talk about this, balancing his church. Jesus wants a balanced church. Pastor, you talked about this before. Not like we're about to. If you're still with me, raise your hand. I'm saying some intense stuff. Are you still with me? I got to look here. You guys still with me? Is this making sense? Am I offending you right now? Because let me help you out. If I'm offending you, this is going to be very forthright. I'm making it real. We're breaking it down plain. Then, friends... What we're doing is we're looking for the kind of bride that's like a corpse. 
where we put makeup on the corpse and we make it look like it's really something special, but it's still dead. Balancing his church. Here it is. Proverbs 11. One. Remember we talked about this? A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. So the Lord says when we rig the scales, when the scales, the, 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 when the triple beam scale, uh, 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 scale is out of balance, that's an abomination to the Lord. Well, let's look at Proverbs 16.11. A just weight and balance are the Lord's. All the weights of the bag. He doesn't rig it. All the weights of the bag are his work. Now, I want you to do me a favor. Write down the word mosaine. M-O-Z-A-N-E. M-O-Z-A-N-E. Got it? Get it down there. That's the Hebrew word for balance. Don't ever forget this word, please. It literally means, the word mosaine, a pair of scales. You can see the scale right there. That's what it means. Now, it also means the weighing of two things on two sides, one scale against the other. This is what they use in the marketplace to make sure that things were weighed out. And so if it was an ounce you were buying, it was 28.7 grams or whatever the case might be, and it was getting it right. See, balance can only come when there are two things involved. You can't balance, you can't just have one thing standing alone. There's no lone rangers in the body of Christ. And I hope you're getting this today, friends. When it comes to balance, it can't just be one thing that's a standalone because there's no comparison contrast. There's no way of seeing, are we really balanced? A lot of us, friends, in the body of Christ, we don't try to balance our walk with Christ against God's standard. We just say, well, I think I'm doing great, and I'm doing wonderful, and I know God's happy. But you have to weigh two things in order to determine balance, if you will. See, so balance can only come when there's two things involved. Everyone say two. You know, one is the loneliest number. There's got to be two things involved. It is a wing of two counter things, two opposing things in order to arrive at balance. Do you see this now? So we've got two different weights, two different sides of the scale, and they are in opposition, counter, opposite sides of the pendulum. And so there has to be two things involved, and there has to be the two different things and counter things. It might be something that's authentic and something that's inauthentic, something that's righteous, something that's unrighteous. But there has to be two things being weighed to determine, are we balanced? In order to have balance, you have to be off balance in order to get balance. I better say that again. In order to have balance, you have to be, what's this? Off balance. Oh, Bill, you got a lot of explaining to do in order to get balance. Example, when I walk, I walk in balance. It takes coordination in order to achieve balance. Did you know that? So let me say it again. When I walk, I walk in balance. So it's walk, walk in the light, walk, walk. Okay, I got balance here. In fact, have you ever seen a person that lacks balance? Have you ever, raise your hand if you've ever seen that before. There's a lot of babies that they lack balance as adults because there's something that happened. As a child, they never learned to crawl. They never developed the muscles and the ligaments, and they never strengthened the discs in the neck along the spinal column. Did you know that? And so because they've never achieved balance, there's a lot of people, if you don't, if you don't learn to crawl, have you ever seen, there's babies that learn to walk without ever crawling. Did you know that? They never did. So here's what happens. So they don't just walk. They don't just have balance where they can go back and forth. It's like every time they walk, they kind of falter or they hold their head to one side or they walk forward trying to get it together. And so here's what happens. i got to tell you this. It's very interesting. This individual who's never achieved balance in their life, if you bring them to a doctor uh, or for behavioral modification as an adult, 
they have to take this adult now and put him in a dark room. Come with me, into the dark room. We're not going to develop film. We're going to develop balance. And this individual that never achieved balance, they have him get on their hands and knees, and what do you think they do? They teach him to crawl. Have you ever heard that? Have you guys ever heard this before? They teach him to crawl in a dark room in order to achieve balance. They have to develop the muscles in the neck, and they have to straighten out the spine because this person never went through the necessary steps in order to achieve the balanced life. It's interesting. And, and so it's through this process. They can never get them the level of balance they would have had if they achieved balance and learned balance and practiced balance through crawling at a young age. So here's what I want to show you. There's a lot of people that lack balance today because they started walking too soon. No delayed gratification. So often we say, oh man, I've heard it before. My son, my daughter, they learned to walk at eight months old and they never crawled. You'll almost always see they've not achieved coordination. They don't have hand-eye coordination. They don't have balance. Now, when I walk, let me walk, I walk in balance. But it takes coordination in order to achieve balance. Now, I'm going to ask Pastor Doug to come join me. We have Pastor Doug with us right now. And this is an important thing that we're going to do. And I'm going to show you. So Pastor Doug's on his way. This is a man of great theological balance. We're going to see if he can really, with Pastor Bill right now, if he can help me with a little bit of balance here. Brother, it is good to see you. I can't touch you because of COVID-19, and so we're going to keep a little bit of uh, virtual reality separation. You think I'm touching him right now, friends? That's your imagination. So let me show you this. When I walk, I'm a, would you say I'm a pretty balanced guy? You are. Yeah, I think so. Now, how about you? Well, we're going to see, because I'm going to have you close your eyes, we're going to put a blindfold on you, and I'm going to get on your shoulders. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you go around 20 times, your wife's going to have you go around real fast, and then we're going to see how balanced you are. And you would say, no. <laughs> that would be a dumb thing to do, okay? But here's what I'm going to show you, and this is important, okay? When I walk, I achieve balance when... Both of my feet, you can't see them right now, but trust me, when both of my feet are on the ground and they're squared with my shoulders. So if, I'm going to show you in a moment, if Pastor Doug tries to push me over this time, he'll have a hard time knocking me over. He's got a little bit more weight than I do. You know, I only weigh about 130 pounds. He's up to 150. So what's going to happen here is you're just going to push me, and don't get radical now because there's also weight and balance involved here. But what I'm going to have him do is with both feet squared, I'm balanced now, friends, okay? And I'm going to stand right here like when I'm snowboarding, which I never do, okay? And, um, I'm, okay, I'm going to do fine here. Oh, he's pushing, but I'm still going to stand. I'm not going to fall. But now we're going to do something a little bit different, okay? When I walk with the intention of getting somewhere, then one of my feet have to leave the ground, and it's easy to knock me over. So let me show you. So I'm going to take one of my feet. I don't think you can see it here, but that's my foot right there, okay, with my blue shoes. Don't step on my blue suede shoes. And so what's going to happen is I'm going to stand up here, and I'm going to lift up a leg. Don't push me up. Not yet. You're, t you're enjoying this way too much. Absolutely. I got a new puppy, and uh, Pastor Doug's really been helping me out. Last night he slept in the kennel with her, so thank you for doing that. It, was, it feels like that, doesn't it? Okay. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift a foot up, He's barely going to even push me. But watch what happens when I have a foot up. I'm, whoa, 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 I'm, 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 I'm out of bounds. Let's try that again. I, I, okay. Do over. Do over. I'm, trying, I'm stronger than you think, really. First of all, let me show you. I have both, both feet squared with my shoulders and just a gentle push. But, you know, right here, I can, I can pretty much stand there. And, you know, would you agree our weight is a little bit different? Little. But I'm going to do fine here, okay? Yeah. But when I lift one foot up, okay, which you have to do to get somewhere, I'm going to lift it up, walk, walk, in the light. With Pastor Doug here, he's a tough guy. It's walk, walk. I got lots of fry height. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to lift a foot up, and he's going to, whoa, 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 whoa. You got me? Yep. You got me? You sure? You got yep. me? Okay, you got you? Okay, yep. Pastor, come got here, you. man. Love you, man. Thank you. Hey, at home, big round of applause for Pastor Doug. 
He's violent. I think he's against Jewish people for what he just did to me. I'm, I'm tough. <laughs> he loves Israel. Mm. But here's what I want you to see. When I walk with the intention of getting somewhere, one of my feet, okay, has to leave the ground, and it was a piece of cake for him to push me over. And here's why. It's because at that split second, I'm off balance as I'm transitioning to my next place of balance. Here it is. Remember, from glory to glory, he's changing me. So when both my feet are square with my shoulders, it's hard to push me over. Oh, if you're bigger than me and you weigh more than me and you're stronger than me, you can push me over. I get that. But I still have my center of gravity here. But every time I lift a foot, which is a good thing, progress, I want to get somewhere. Every time I lift that foot, I'm out of balance. But I'm going from balance to imbalance to balance. It's necessary, if you will. There has to be a working of balance in order to achieve progression. This is what the rabbis taught. This is a Jewish concept. Many of us, we say, I'm balanced because nobody can push me over. I'm a self-made man. I am founded in him. I'm rooted in Jesus. I'm established in him. My feet are fitted with the ever-readiness of the gospel of peace. And, but we're missing it. You're right. It's hard to push me over because like religion, I'm an immovable rock. I'm unwilling to make any changes. I've got my feet deeply planted, not in Christ, but often in religion, and it's tough to push me over. But if you're ever going to make progress, friends, if we're ever going to get from point A to point B, if we're ever going to be all that Christ has called us to be, you have to be willing to risk falling. You have to be willing to risk being pushed over, if you will. There has to be a working of balance in order to make progression. Some churches have done this, if you will. A person stands square and they refuse to move. There's no way I'm moving. You know, God's doing some incredible things. This is not hashtag me too with women right now, friends, but God is doing some incredible things with women right now. And God is calling women, like in the New Testament church, Priscilla. Or let's talk about the daughters. There's, oh, I, I shouldn't get in this, but there were these daughters of a, I'm not going to tell you the guy's name. I just decided not to. You have to look it up. But he had, what, about seven daughters that all prophesied, and they were used mightily. Who's the first person who can find out who it was? I, I, I so want to tell you, but I'm not going to tell you. In the Old Testament, who was the woman judge who led Israel? Deborah. Maybe you know her as Deborah, but it's actually Deborah. And some of God's best men are women. And friends, God has been telling us to lift our foot. And there's some moves that need to happen here. And some of us, we have some stinking thinking and bad theology. Oh, a woman should never speak in the church. That's actually, the Bible doesn't teach that. It does not teach that. It's talking about women that usurp authority over men, and it's talking about women who are not in kingdom order, and it's talking about women in the early church at the church of Corinth where there was a real issue going on. Well, I'm not giving you all the debates there, but many of us here, the Lord's doing something with the Holy Spirit now. Jesus said, I have left so the Holy Spirit can come. And he's doing something remarkable. But so many of us are immovable. We're standing in our doctrine. We're standing in our theology, even where it's wrong. And we refuse to make the change. See, friends, here's our problem. So many of us refuse to move. And we say, if I move, I'll be out of balance. But how do you lead people to Christ if you don't move? How do we get people healed? These signs shall follow them that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. The apostle Paul refused to stay in one place. He had to go to Antioch. He had to go to Ephesus. He had to go to Colossae. He had to go to Thessalonica. He had to put one foot in front of the other. And he had to risk being pushed over. And every single church he ever established, every single church came under an unbelievable attack. And he was always having to undergird and resolidify and reestablish the churches because of all the attacks. In order to be a balanced church, Many of us say, I'm going to stay put. Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. I'm not going to move. 
But friends, there's times God tells us we have to move. You see, if the early church wasn't willing to move, then the church would never have left Jerusalem. If the early church wasn't willing to move, there would have been no church in Corinth, no church in Thessalonica, no church in Galatia, no church in Corinth, no church... You're getting the whole Asia Minor thing? I think you're getting it. You see, friends, in order to be a balanced church, you may say, I'm going to stay put. And the Lord says, I want you to literally, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Yes, that's true, but he still says, take a risk. Come on, take a risk. You can lift that foot. But the devil's going to try to push me over. The Bible says, though I fall, I will not be cast down because the Lord with his right hand of salvation upholds me with his hands, if you will. I saw what happened when the Pentecostals got filled with the Holy Spirit, somebody says, and they, oh no, it's terrible. They spoke in tongues. I'm not going to move. Romans 8, 26 and 27 talks about a prayer language. It talks about times I do not know how to pray. It talks about times that there's moanings and groanings that the Holy Spirit will make through me, interceding for me, Holy Spirit bearing witness with the Spirit. And there's a lot of folks saying, because of all the abuses and friends as charismatics, there's been some charismaniac stuff. There's been some crazy stuff. There's been stuff we've misinterpreted at times. I understand that. But don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You still have to be willing to walk, walk in the light, walk, walk. We've got to be willing to put up one foot in front of the other. And again, when you lift that one foot up, it's hard to balance, friends. But I'm telling you, and to get, we, we want to go from one place of balance to another place of balance to another place of balance. So it goes from balance to imbalance to solidification of total balance, if you will. But those Pentecostals, some of them got too extreme, out of balance. Therefore, I, I'm unwilling to grow. <laughs> I'm unwilling to progress for fear of getting out of balance. And here's the concept. I'm going to build my church. And the church that I am going to build that the gates of hell will not prevail against, that's coming up next week or the week after, he's saying you've got to be willing to take a risk. Walk on the wild side. You have to be willing to know wherever there's fresh fire, there will be wildfire. Let me say that again. Wherever there's fresh fire, friends, this is the Lord, man. There's going to be wildfire, and we'll find balance. There's times we're going to fall on our keister, as we say in Yiddish. Hmm. Did you know that all denominations have taken some steps at times? You look back at the Methodist movement through John Wesley. Today you look at Methodism, friends, and they're afraid to take a step. Some of them have taken a step in the wrong direction. Thus, you get the United Methodists, and you get them doing gay marriages and doing some really out-of-the-box, bizarre stuff. I get that. But if you look back at the history of even the Lutherans, man, the Reformation, there's people that took some steps, and there's a time of being out of balance. And some people don't like the steps. We don't like the new thing the Lord is doing. We don't like the direction the church is going. It violates our comfort zone. That's what happened with the Pharisees, the religious leaders. That's what happened with the Essenes. That's what happened with the Sanhedrin. That's what I could give you list after list, friends, of what happened with all these folks, the Sadducees as well. We're so afraid of moving forward. So what happens? People say, I'm not taking another step. So the Jews said, we won't accept Jesus as Lord. We won't even consider the, pos- the option, the possibility that Jesus might be Lord because it's going to cost us our money. It's going to cost us our position. It's going to cost us our prestige. That's what the Pharisees did. So they stood resolute, firm. How many of us, we won't make change? We, w- we refuse to be changed The Lord is doing a new thing in our life. He's doing a new work. He wants this change to take place. But we say, "Uh uh-uh, Lord, I'm not speaking in tongues. I don't like the gifts of the Spirit. I don't want people to laugh at me, so I refuse to be a part of it. However, there are seasons of, for every movement of God and every move of God, there are seasons of extremism, emotionalism, and even an emphasis on one doctrine for a season. 
This happened with the Word of Faith movement. Friends, this can happen with worship. It can happen with so many things. The fact is, the people are just in transition. Once they complete the step, they come back into balance. Friends, I've watched this in the charismatic movement. Nazarenes used to be called the Pentecostal church, and God's done great things. My master's degree is from a Nazarene university, Olivet Nazarene, back in Kankakee slash Bourbon A, Illinois. And there's people that are saying, because of abuses, because of the fear of extremism, because of the fear of hyper-emotionalism, I'm going to stand resolute. I'm going to be deeply rooted in my belief system. And how often do we miss the new thing that God is doing? For those who are afraid of being extreme, or you're afraid you're going to be off balance, you're never going to grow. It's like snowboarding. If you're not willing to be off balance, you'll never get into balance. You'll never grow. You'll never move to the next level. I cannot begin to tell you how many people that I know, friends, they're afraid. This is prophetic. I hope you'll receive this. They're afraid, and at times we are afraid of looking silly, looking stupid, looking as if we're failing. And I'm here to tell you today, in order to mosaic, Echeleo Mosain, to be a balanced church, you've got to take a risk. But Pastor Bill, there might be extremism, and we might make some mistakes, and we might have some failures, and we might even get pushed over at times. <laughs> Praise God. During revival, friends, I took a lot of steps in faith. I mean, fasting was a real work of faith. Friends, it was amazing what God did but I had to be willing to be a little bit out of control. This happens with prophecy, friends. This happens with all the gifts of the Spirit. When you lay hands on the sick so they can recover, there's times as you take that step of faith, you feel so out of balance, if you will. So I want to ask you this question. Since we're afraid of looking foolish, looking silly, and we want to make sure we maintain balance and that we don't get pushed over. I want to ask you a question. How would you like to nail your feet down and die right where you're at right now? Come on. We're talking about what kind of church is Jesus building. C.S. Lewis puts it this way in the Chronicles of Narnia. When I don't know if it was Lucy or which of the daughter, which one of the kids in the Chronicles of Narnia, they asked a question about Aslan, the lion who represents Jesus, and said, Is he safe? And another lady says, oh, no, darling, he's not safe, but he's good. Friends, Christianity was never designed to be safe. It's supposed to be risky business. There's times you're going to be pushed over, but the Lord says, I am in, you are in my hand, and not one can pluck you out. I'm going to keep you as the apple of my eye, that I'm going to hide you under the shadow of my wing." But some people would say, I'd rather nail my feet down and die right where I'm at. Does that sound too bizarre? Let's just think about it. You see, friends, I like growing and progressing and coming into maturity. The Bible says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I acted as a child. But when I became an adult, I put behind me childish things. So here's my question. Okay? Do you want to grow? Do you want to progress? Do you want to become complete, as James puts it, in Christ Jesus? Do you want to come to a place of maturity? You've got to be willing to take a step. And somebody might push you. There may be resistance. But you can't grow and mature if you're not willing to take steps. I feel like the movie, What About Bob? Baby steps. When I take a step, let me do it, I may wobble a bit. And that's okay. You see, ultimately, friends, you have to be willing to take that step and then stand firm. You've got to be willing to be firmly founded and established in Christ. But you can't do that by just staying there and saying, I don't care about the new thing God is doing. I don't care that God is stretching my faith. I don't care that he's bringing me to a new place. The church is always going to be in transition as it moves to another place. Let me say this, strength. I said uh, ch the church will always be in transition 
as it moves to another strength. And this is what's tough, friends, even as your pastor. There's change coming. I, can you can see it blowing in the wind? I said, there is change coming. There's a new thing. Friends, there's change happening in our country right now. And some of us, friends, some of the change is horrible. Some of it's wonderful. But some of us, man, we're so stubborn. We're so resolute. We're so unwilling to change. But we have to be willing to recognize today if we're going to be balanced in Christ, we have to be willing to recognize that change requires risk and change requires doing something a new way and change requires the prophetic. It requires words of knowledge, words of wisdom. It requires the supernatural. Change, friends, there's a change coming. Always means, friends, there's going to be a little bit of wobbling along the way. You think about the civil rights movement. There's some good things that have come out of the civil rights movement. Let's not put the whole thing down, friend. There's some really good things there. And a lot of folks, they stand so firm. And then as history has its eyes on them, as they say in the musical Hamilton, a lot of folks have been found to be on the wrong side of history. But friends, I got to tell you right now, this also means that whether you're a liberal or a conservative, that's irrelevant to this discussion right now. But I want you to know when there's change, right now, liberals and conservatives, everyone's standing their ground. This country, and I'm going to tell you prophetically, is on the verge of a civil war. Do you believe me? It's on the verge of a civil war. Friends, I'm finding a lot of Christians are not acting very Christian in the process. A balanced church often requires seasons of what? Imbalance. You know, whenever Marge and I take a risk and we've wanted to grow in our marriage, we've got a balanced marriage. But it often requires a season of imbalance. Some of you men need to be willing to take a step and you're so afraid she'll take advantage. Some of you women, you're so afraid he's going to take advantage and you don't want to take that step because you're afraid of falling flat on your face. Take a risk anyway. Jesus said, I will build my church. The church is going to be a group of balanced people, not a bunch of extremists. The dictionary divines balance. You got to follow this really slow, but it's really good. It's good, man. The dictionary defines balance as a general harmony between the parts of anything. See the balance, the scale, the triple beam? Stability and steadfastness. And st let, me, let me do this again. A general harmony, this is balance, between the parts of anything. Stability and steadfastness due to the principle of equilibrium. So the way you achieve stability and steadfast, steadfastness is you've got balance. You've got equilibrium. That means as you lift one foot, you've got enough balance to be able to establish firm balance, if you will. See, balance is when you bring the harmony of parts. That's the body of Christ, friends. The harmony of parts, and you blend them together, and you achieve ultimately the goal of what? Stability. How many of us, we need to take a step of faith? Friends, we need to lift one foot and another foot in front of the other foot, and we have to be willing to walk into a place of stability and steadfastness. When you bring in stability and steadfastness because of the principle of equilibrium, the weights shift. What does that mean? So it's distributed correctly. Let me say this again, friends. When you bring in stability, God's saying, take a step. A step of faith take a step of faith but yes you're gonna be a little wobbly but as you take that step of faith and steadfastness and follow through even if you get pushed over a few times even if you're a little wobbly even if there's a little bit of fear factor there but because of the principle of equilibrium so you're compensating is to take each step from left to right from center of gravity back and forth you're creating this equilibrium and saying, I still sense balance even when one foot is out of balance. You see, whenever you take a step, let me say this again. Whenever you take a step, 
that is when you're the most vulnerable to toppling over. Whenever you take a step and put one foot in front of the other, that's when it's the easiest for somebody to push you over. You know what our goal is for Hemet Church? It's to build a church that's taking risks. We're, we're risky, man. This is risky business. Our goal for Hemet Church is to build a body that has balance. We want to learn to stand in Christ. The Bible says after you've done everything to stand, you need to do what? Stand. We want to be that balanced church. But here's the key. When we lift up a foot, we're going to move in the prophetic. We're going to lift up a foot and move into revival. Friends, when we walk one foot in front of the other through the valley of the shadow of death, we're not going to fear any evil. We're going to have stability in our lives. And you might say, I don't think I want to do this, friends. And as you take that step, there's a weight. The Bible tells us what the weight is. The word Shekinah, glory of God, speaks of a weightiness. Okay? It speaks of a heaviness and God's glory. You remember from glory to glory, he's transitioning me. From glory to glory, he's changing me. And so when I take one step in front of the other and I keep my eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, wherever your eyes are focused, friends, that's where your body's going to go. I keep my eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of my faith. And as I take one step in front of another, it keeps my center of gravity intact. It's a law of physics, friends. Grab hold of it. But here at Hemet Church, we want to build a balanced church. Imbalance causes delayed consequences. Friends, I know churches that are so into revival, and I love revival. And that's all they do. They focus on revival, and they no longer focus on the Word of God. They no longer focus on balanced worship. They no longer focus on a balanced body of believers, friends. And you can have a great move of God for a season, but you miss the bigger picture. God may use extremes in order to bring us back to balance, not to create an extreme church. So there's times a church is dead. Dead as a doornail. DOA, dead on arrival. And the Lord says, you know what, guys? There's no life of the Spirit. There's no excitement in Christ. When people come in there, they see the frozen chosen. And there's times the Lord gives us a bit of an extreme just to bring us back into balance. It's like when they take the paddles in the hospital, friends, and you're a, you have a heart arrhythmia. You, 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 your, your heart is not beating as it ought to beat. Guess what? There's times those paddles are extreme with the goal of bringing your heart rate back into kingdom order. If a church stays in in an extreme of the, I don't know, the prophetic or in the area of worship or the shepherding movement or John the Baptist political church or, or they're just totally focused on the Reformation, guess what? They will suffer consequences. I've been to churches that have phenomenal worship. Have you? I mean phenomenal worship. That is their main thing, friends. But no teaching, no relationships, and people ultimately dry up or leave because they suffer from a deficiency due to an imbalanced church. Well, let me show you. Let, here's a, let me give you a picture. You see that beautiful plate of food? All the carbs, all the protein. I mean, you got some pretty bad bread there, but that's okay. But then you have another plate. That's what my wife calls a balanced diet. On my right, your left, and <laughs> that's desserts right there. Come on now. And that's the thing. This is called imbalance. You see, we're supposed to have a balanced diet. Isn't it amazing? It's, it, it's the Word of God. When my diet is not in balance, my weight won't be in balance. When my diet's not in balance, friends, my energy level will not be in balance. In fact, friends, when I do not have a balanced diet with complex carbohydrates, with essential fats, and with uh, high protein, and you get it, then friends, ultimately, there are severe physical consequences that can lead to pancreatic cancer, liver cancer, blood diseases, uh, osteoporosis, and the list goes on and on and on. See, friends, 
many of us, our diet is built on chocolate. <laughs> and chocolate's not a bad thing. Or just on a high protein without complex carbohydrates, without the right kind of vegetables. Do you know some churches are imbalanced in their diet? It's all youth. They miss Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov. They miss the patriarchs. The church is built on the patriarchs. They miss Elijah. They miss Jeremiah. They miss Isaiah. The church is built on the prophets. They miss Peter and Paul and Bartholomew. And the, uh, the church is also built on the apostles, if you will. The church can become, if we're not careful, a youth organization, not a church. It lacks stability. The church can become nothing but worship. It lacks stability. Some churches are just teaching but there's no life. There's no worship. There's a great church here in California. The guy can teach and preach the paint off the wall. But the worship is pray for the dead and the dead will pray for you. And the guy can teach. But friends, we're called to be a balanced church. Some churches just teach on the end times. In uh, Illinois, there's a church that's still in existence today. They just teach on demonology. They just teach on demon possession. They just teach on deliverance. That's not a balanced church. Everything in some churches is just the end times. Eschatological, apocalyptic. Friends, how balanced are we? Is your marriage balanced? As a parent, how balanced is your family, if you will? Everything, friends. There's churches that only teach on, uh, and a lot of them are my, my type of churches, friends, Hebrew roots or messianic. It's all on the Moedim, the seven festivals. That's important to learn. But everything they teach is just on kind of that one little lane, that one little strain, that one little vein, if you will. Many people claim to know who the Antichrist is and everything they teach. It's all about the third temple in Israel. It's all about the Antichrist. And are you getting the point today? There's people, you, and every time you watch them on TV, they got the charts, they got the timelines, they got the graphs. The problem is, friends, I've watched many churches that can teach on the end times. They can teach on the Moedim. They can teach on the prophetic. But unfortunately, throughout the church and even in the pulpit, their marriages are going to pot and their kids are lost. We're called to be a balanced. Everyone say Mosaine. Mosaine. A balanced church. You ask them, what do they believe? And they point to a chart. <laughs> they point to a graph. They point to a map, if you will. They tell you they know who the false prophet is. You ask them, what are they doing? What are you doing with your life? What are you doing to share Jesus with other people? I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting. You ask them about evangelism. They say, as for me and my house, we're studying the charts. And there's no evangelism whatsoever. These churches have no influence, no testimony, no family life. But boy, do they have charts. Do they have graphs. Do they have intellectualism. And I'm not against this. We believe in end-time churches. I'm a Jew. I believe in the seven festivals, the Moedim. I believe there's so much to learn there. But it's one truth. It can't be the goal of the church. So I want to ask you, what kind of church are we building? Is it based on the prophets? Is it based on the apostles? Is it based on Jesus, the cornerstone? And we're going to continue to move in this area, but I want to ask you, in what area is your life out of balance today? If your diet's out of balance, you're going to get sick. If your diet is out of balance, there's going to be gaps in your faith. If, you're, if, you're, if you are out of balance, friends, you may sacrifice an entire generation of children who do not get a holistic approach and understanding and insight into who Jesus Christ is. So here it is, just three questions. Number one, in what area is your life out of balance? I got some areas, friends. In what, 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 what if there's a deficiency, like if you lack calcium in your life, in the middle of the night, I wouldn't be surprised if you're getting up and eating a full gallon of ice cream. It sounds good, but often when a person just begins to, I mean, when there's an imbalance in your life, like if you have an iron deficiency, do you like to chew ice? You're always chomping on ice? That's almost always a sign of an iron deficiency. See, our body tells us when there's areas that we're out of balance, where it's not together, 
In the same way, Jesus Christ shows us areas as a church, as a body, as a believer, where we're out of balance. And I want to encourage you today, if we're going to say this for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. God loves a just weight, a righteous balance, and all the, all the weights, they belong to the Lord. And he never rigs the deck, man. He never manipulates the deck. And so I want to ask you today, how open are you to saying, Lord, I'm part of the church. It's not my personal preference. It's not what do I feel gifted at. It's not what's my talent. God is not building a church based on your or my preferences or our emphases. He's building his church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so today I want you to be in prayer all week on, Lord, help me to be a balanced person, helping to build a balanced church that I may have a balanced approach to bringing other people to Christ that I may tell them, taste and see that the Lord is is good. Love you guys. God bless you. We're going to open up the Zoom room here in 15 minutes at 7.30 and um, it officially opens at 7.45 and I just want you to come in there and tell me where do you need to become more balanced? I constantly have areas the Lord's convicting me, directing me, giving me laser focus where there needs to be changes and I am so glad that we are building something and we are a part of something bigger than us. Oh and by the way, never forget God's favor is on you.